<laughs> we were never coming back. <laughs> I had faith we'd be here. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. What is going on here? What I don't know. That? What is going on here? Yeah, that was a technical thing. It's fine. Hey, oh. welcome back to another episode of 1980s. Now, a weekly examination of the importance of 1980s pop culture and its influence today. Hey, everybody. My name is Will, and joining me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, Cat and John. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Hey, hey. Hello. <laughs> no moogly wooglies. Uh, is that what you're waiting for? I was <laughs> waiting. I was waiting. Yes. For and that's why. <laughs> obscure reference. Gonna... There you go. <laughs> obscure? It was from yeah. our latest. John making obscure cartoon references. <laughs> oh, well, that was obscure, yes. <laughs> uh, hey, on today's show, we're going to talk about uh, the, a roadhouse. You know, not mm-hmm. only the uh, latest reboot uh, from. Uh, it just came out just a couple of weeks ago, but we're going to talk about the original as well and uh, compare and contrast pros and cons, A and B, uh-huh. all the sorts of things that will get to the Coke root and Pepsi. Of. Yeah. Oh. Yes. We're going to do a blind taste test of Swayze versus Gyllenhaal. Oh. Mm, and you're going to have to oh, figure wait. out what that is. I'm yeah. Blind? Wait. Wait. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cat's like, now you're talking. Bring I it. get to taste oh. Swayze? <laughs> He's probably a little dusty right now. He's, oh, he's so good. oh, no, 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 no. What? Cat's like, like, I need to try Cat's the... Like, I, I got to try the second one again. And now the first? No. Let me try the no, second this one, one definitely again. tastes more alive. Yeah. Some t- oh, no, that's bad. John's trying to keep keep us out of the gutter. I see what he's doing. Try it. Wait. I think when this is the kind that? of this is the kind of wit that's gotten John out of trouble lots of times throughout his life. You know, <laughs> anytime anything was getting a little too heated, oh, uh, just diffuse it with humor as best yeah. I can. With morbid make allusions, humor, <laughs> make allusions to the dead yeah. as quickly as possible. That'll shut him up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Uh, we are, by the way, we are now uh, chatting to you live uh, as we stream mm-hmm. this episode on Facebook and YouTube. Mm-hmm. And you uh, should join us, too, sometime, uh, some 7 p.m., or some Wednesday, rather, at 7 p.m. Eastern. We mm-hmm. do it, and we chat, and we take your comments, and we give them to everybody else. Mm-hmm. And speaking of YouTube, before I forget, please check out John at uh, Genix uh, Grown Up. No. He's his Thank very you. own Grown Up YouTube channel there where it's constantly <laughs> exploding. <laughs> <laughs> with riches with some with riches <laughs> yes. in, or imploding or <laughs> yeah. you taste john and, too take taste it get a taste of <laughs> wow oh and oh. you want to watch live because there's yeah. so much that will edits out it's uh, like if you watch live you're kind of part of a secret club that knows yeah. i wouldn't even say how the sausage is made because it's almost like a show in and of itself seeing the show being turned into a show so mm. i say that from inside i don't know what it's like from the outside but I know, I hear the things that are edited out. I'm like, well, only the live people saw that. <laughs> yeah. It, you, it's true, John. And you're right. And some of the decisions I make are like, I don't want anybody to know about this. So I'm going to keep this out. <laughs> but I know that whoever was here already heard it. Yeah, and they know. Yeah. Honestly, I've been wrestling with whether or not you could find them if you look online. You could find the live ones. But I'm wondering if I should just take them down after they're live. So it's just for folks who are here. And the only mm. other thing everybody else can hear is just the edited versions. Oh. Um, Make the club even more exclusive. Mm. Yeah. Right. Or you could just tuck them in under a tab somewhere on YouTube. Oh, if they're on the something. internet, they will be found. Stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tab ain't going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> if I've learned anything about the internet. Oh, uh. <laughs> <sighs> oh Will's curious. <laughs> what have you learned about the internet? <laughs> No, things having I've learned John. things today about the internet that I didn't know, but that's mm. neither here nor there. That's right. <laughs> hey, before we talk about the roadhouses and the various, uh, you know, uh, something or others about them, we mm-hmm. are going to talk. Uh, we're going to catch up on uh, current news stories related to 1980s media, including DNA just helped solve a 1980 murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ghostbusters is officially mm-hmm. a billion-dollar franchise, and the musical make that. The musical mistake that John Williams made on Star Wars: A New Hope. What? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> that he's not John. capable of mistakes, man. That's exactly what mm. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least I not... tend to agree with you, Kat. 
we witnessed, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe there's something before the editing or, you know, okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, the editing of John Williams, right? Not the show. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be a little, you know, comparing the two situations okay. there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the sausage well, being made just thing. Like John Williams. <laughs> And the one, and the two, and uh, let's get caught up on 1980s news. Uh, I think that was more Lawrence Welk than John Williams. I think actually. you're right. Yeah, that was. Mm-hmm. What it was, whatever it was, it was awful. I won't do it again, and I promise you that. Hey, as reported uh, by uh, this week in 1980s news, as reported by NBC News, an Oregon man has been found guilty of a 1980 murder thanks to DNA. It sounded like you said an organ man. And I was like, yes. oh, no, this has it's gotten true. worse. It's oh, true. No. He's all organs, no skin, no muscle, no bone. <laughs> you oh, think they no. would have caught him sooner. <laughs> oh. Based on the police sketch that I saw, I think he would have been easy to find. <laughs> and all the squishy, wet footprints at the scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. From... It was more <laughs> like a slug trail. Organs yeah. he walks. <laughs> Ew. Anyway, back to the serious uh, macabre story I'm about to share with you about a woman who was brutally assaulted and murdered, Cat. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're done with your jokes. For your wow. years now, nobody knew who killed Barbara May Tucker. She was killed mm-hmm. on January 15, 1980, and her body was found the following morning in a wooded area between Keene Road and a school parking lot in, in Gresham, Oregon, by students arriving for class. She mm-hmm. was expected to uh, show up for a class and never arrived. Uh, while her co- uh, case was cold for years, investigators gave a ca- the uh, case a fresh look with advances in DNA technology. In 2000, uh, DNA swabs taken during her autopsy were sent to the Oregon State Police Crime Lab for analysis, and a DNA mm-hmm. profile was made from the swabs. Then, 20 years later, in 2021, a genealogist from Parabon Nanolabs identified Robert Plimpton as the likely contributor to the unknown DNA profile developed in 2000. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. police uh, found him where he was living and they started surveilling him. Well, as they were watching him one day, they saw him spit out a piece of gum on the ground. And the detectives mm-hmm. quickly quickly collected it and submitted it to the crime, <laughs> crime labs for analysis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know john's providing foley for this and i think that's perfect because when i read this story you know i was led to it because it was set in the 80s it had to do with dna because i know something about dna from the 80s that i'm going to share in just a moment oh my but when i found when i got to the part about the gum i wanted to know what kind of gum it was is that wrong oh (laughs) was it (laughs) was it (laughs) something that wrigley's uses in their marketing go forward going forward Fresh in oh. your breath, catch a killer. Oh. Or, um, or I guess maybe you'd want to avoid oh. it, I guess, if you're a killer. <laughs> Don't eat it if you're guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Don't chew gum or spit it out if you, if uh, if you're in a Try time. spearmint. Wrigley's will, <laughs> will drop a dime on you. <laughs> the fresh taste of innocence. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway. So they take the, they send this piece of gum to the the, the analysis and, and they it's a match you know that's how they that's how they figure mm. it so following a bench trial from february 26 to march 15th judge amy Baggi, baggio or baggio uh, found plimpton guilty of murder on, on four count and mm. four counts of this is so word is unusually but this is a quote straight out of the uh, judgment four mm. counts of different theories of murder in the second degree okay. now end quote now i'm sure that has to do with legally how they have murder mm-hmm. in oregon because different states do okay. it differently so they call okay. theirs you know so different theories of murder it sounds like people just like i, I don't know uh maybe he um <laughs> and they're like yeah, it sounds pretty good guilty what else you got if he didn't do that what did he do <laughs> right are we playing clue it was the guy chewing gum in the woods with a hatchet that's one theory just one that i had <laughs> all right two count. we got two theories now i got i'll give you both of those <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm gonna skip this part because this is really dark. Anyway, this uh, this guy oh, remains in custody uh, in uh, until he's gonna be sentenced in June. Uh, but I bring this up in partly like, because of the reasons I mentioned to you. Even though we didn't find out what kind of gum he was chewing, uh, mm-hmm. DNA was invoked, and I wanted to let you guys know this because 
I've been, I've been wanting to share this story and I'm not going to share the full story now because I think it could be a true crime, although it, it's dark, Ooh. but I think we're getting to a point where dun, 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 dun. some of the true crimes I may store, share are dark. And this one, I'm leaving out some of the details to keep the 1980s news light, but mm -hmm. uh, British gen geneticist Sir Alec Jeffries discovered the technique of uh, DNA testing to, de to determine a genetic fingerprint in 1984. Wow. Some horns for that. Let's see. Where's our horns? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so along with the many wonderful movies <laughs> and albums that celebrate a 40th anniversary this year, so too does this now commonplace technique for... Uh, determining who's a criminal, you know, or uh, mm -hmm. solving crimes, I suppose. But um, he says that he had his ribonucleic acid. Yes, something like Go that. On. Yeah. Wait, you both know that. You both can make that up. ribonucleic acid. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I loved <laughs> memorizing that. <laughs> oh, Miss Herod would be so proud of me. Oh. <laughs> I don't remember who I learned that from, but thank you, whatever science teacher. John could have made it up. You could have agreed just as a goof on me, and I would have just <laughs> went along with it because I have no clue. You still don't know. We could still be no. BSing. <laughs> no. In fact, you just said it, and I couldn't repeat it back to you. I know the A was acid. I caught that part. There you go. Yeah. Will was anyway. dropping beats like while this, we were doing was. our science. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just quote? What? What did you just what? quote? Say you again? were, I, I, I was saying, I meant you were paying more attention to music and DJing. I said you were dropping beats oh. while we oh. were on the streets. Science? And in the sheets. Oh, okay. oh wait, what? <laughs> wait. <laughs> okay. I'm so right. confused. All, All right. right. <laughs> anyway, so this scientist, uh, uh, it's uh, a compliment. Okay. Take it. I mean, right. <laughs> Will is shell shocked. Uh, he thinks anytime we're laughing, we're laughing at him no, no, at this no, point. No, 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 is what no, no. it is. I thought Cat. I'm <laughs> shell shocked. Because I thought Cat was I'm pretty sure she was uh, quoting the Beastie Boys. I oh. I did, but uh, not on I, purpose. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this back on track here. Here we go. Wrestling this back to uh, on track here. So, so this scientist okay. Jeffrey says he had his eureka moment while working at the laboratory in the Department of Genetics at the University of Leicester, England. After looking at the X-ray film uh, image of DNA of a DNA experiment which unexpectedly showed both similarities and differences between DNA of different members of uh, his technician's family. Mm. Uh, so within about a half an hour, of, mm -hmm. within about a half hour of noticing this, he realized the possible scope of DNA fingerprinting, which as you know, uses variations in our genetic co code to identify individuals. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was first put in use just the next year after that, 1985, when he was asked to help uh, in a disputed uh, immigration case to confirm the identity of a British boy whose family was originally from Ghana. And then the following year in 1986, f DNA fingerprinting was first used to solve a crime. Hmm. Of course, uh, you know, now it's ubiquitous in various mm -hmm. uh, pop culture and in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to find out when the first time it was used in a film or, or television as a, you know, a plot point. I wasn't mm -hmm. able to confirm the precise thing, but it seems like it didn't really show up in media until the early 1990s, which, okay. you know, mm -hmm. probably makes sense given makes sense. the uh, untried yeah. sort of nature of it and how suspicious of it. I'm sure people were probably initially and, you know, for it to seep in <laughs> from the scientific world into the entertainment mm -hmm. uh, landscape. And, and just that word, deoxyribonucleic acid, that's just, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to slow things down. <laughs> uh, that's right. Well, and, and one point of order, not, not to be pedantic, but you said it's to identify people. If I understand DNA correctly, if, yeah. if my education did anything, mm -hmm. it actually can't identify you, but it can eliminate you to the mm -hmm. point where the number of people it could be are like you and no one else. It's, it's like, well, it can't be you and it can't be you. It's one in 50 bajillion and there's not that many people on the planet kind of thing is how I've heard it used. But again, I'm no geneticist. But then doesn't that belie or doesn't that contradict the, this concept of having a, a DNA match where I say these certain markers are this and this guy has these same markers. There you go. They call it a match because I enough markers must match in order for it to right. mathematically couldn't be anyone else because there's right. not that many people on the planet. Yeah, right. that's right. That's my understanding of it. So the match is bad news for you. It's you or someone else that doesn't exist. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> or someone else on the planet, as I understand now, adding on to what John's just remembering anecdotally. 
that's mm-hmm. just wasn't living in this county in that year. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a likelihood right. that someone else with yeah. the same it narrows down. Marker, narrows down. They're sure. they're on the other side of the world. Mm-hmm. You got mm-hmm. it. Like, yeah. That's a hell of an alibi. But yes, still <laughs> yes. good that we got him with gum. We can make those into some commemorative gum pants and celebrate his right. incarceration. <laughs> right. Fingerprint my gum pants. Or DNA, DNA test, gum pants. Don't DNA Ooh. test my gum pants, guys. It, it's oh. Guys, <laughs> that stain was already there. Guys, come on! I swear, your fruit stripe no. uh, convict gum that's, pants. That's, yeah. Yes, I swear it's a fruit stripe. That's what the stripe is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you guys know this already because mm-hmm. you know already yes. more than I do with even with regard to the uh, acronym or the abbreviation. Mm-hmm. But that the DNA of all human beings, this goes to John's point, is nearly identical. That is approximately ninety nine point nine percent of the sequence in DNA. Mm-hmm. is in the exact same order mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that determines that determines our you know sort of biological features uh mm-hmm. two eyes they're located in a general area we have longer you know forearms and calves all these yeah. kinds of things well it's a recipe to make a person or to make any it, anything on the planet right the, the dna is like well how do you yep. make one of these well here's how you put the eyes and the nose and the mouth right. and the butthole and where all these things go correctly and don't mess it up right. and so <laughs> if you all those are the same. That's why I think those markers come into play, the deviations from what's universal. I, sure. I yep. I'm not yep. a geneticist, but there we go. <laughs> mm, you oh. sure sound like one. <laughs> you do. Yeah. You have another, uh, all their sideline. You got this. You got Gen X grown up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. What and is, is for you? solving yeah. crime with gum. Yeah. There we go. My, there are, however. Triple threat. <laughs> and I only know this because I read it. I, I don't know this. I've already proven I'm not you know, knowledgeable enough to know this. Huh. But there are, however, places in, in, on the human DNA molecule that are different. And of the approximately 3.2 billion, billion with the B base pairs in the hun, human genome, some th- 3 million base pairs of DNA, about 0.1%, vary from person to person. So it's just mm-hmm. that little percentage mm-hmm. there that they're really looking at. Yep. That's at the core of DNA right. testing. Yes. I, lo- I love this stuff. I love that they can... Yeah, have something from way, <laughs> way back and whoop, solve that crime. I love that they can do that. Uh, Miss So says, the butthole, odd area to focus on, homie. <laughs> now, Miss So. <laughs> uh, really? Do we, does this tie to our conversation about aliens and John? I don't know. <laughs> I, that was, I, was picking, I was picking random orifices from a list. <laughs> that came up alphabetically. Mm-hmm. John Foolery. Sounds yeah. like some John Foolery to me. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. This week in other 1980s news, as reported by mm-hmm. Slash Film, Ghostbusters is officially a $1 mm-hmm. billion dollar franchise. Oh, wow. Now, talking about anniversaries, uh, the original film <laughs> Ghostbusters is set to celebrate its anniversary this July. Uh, with the first film having premiered uh, just 40 years ago in 1984. Mm. Uh, but even before that, uh, you know, momentous uh, occasion, Ghostbusters as a franchise is now worth $1 billion or has achieved $1 billion in box office uh, gross. I guess not uh, gross, box office. Mm-hmm. Period. Mm-hmm. Period. And that's uh, thanks in part to its latest entry, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was surprised to learn that being part of what john they made some money and i put them over but it's good for the congratulations for them they needed more money the old movie's not bringing it in they needed more i mean they they did this without my money yet i haven't gotten to see it yet (laughs) i'm not disagreeing with the financial state oh okay it's okay all right carry on well, as a result, <laughs> uh, oh, Ghostbusters has now joined a, a relatively few franchises in cinema history that have that can claim to uh, have earned at least ten figures in ticket sales. Wow! Uh, okay. mm-hmm. But yes, in spite of John's, uh, I don't know what he's besmirching or something, some word. Uh, the most recent <laughs> film, uh, the fourth <laughs> film canonically, and Sony's a franchise just came mm-hmm. out this past. Or last week, in collected upon during its uh, opening weekend, four point five two million dollars, mm-hmm. with an additional uh, sixteen uh, million, roughly uh, internationally, earning about uh, sixty one million dollars at the start of its uh, run. 
Hmm. Have you seen it, John? Is that why you're uh, poo-pooing? Seen it? what? The Ghostbusters frozen Vampire? dumpster fire? Yeah, I have oh. seen it. Oh, yeah. no. Come oh. on. Are you kidding me? <sighs> I guess I know what too, we're talking about. Too early about. for spoilers. Too Next early for spoilers. Week? <laughs> yeah. and you're, you're darn right it is because I'm seeing it Friday. I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. It's too, way too I'm early for spoilers. Darned. Now, John, <sighs> remind me. With regard to <sighs> uh, Afterlife, yes. you, you liked loved the, it. Afterlife, right? Yeah, you loved really it. Loved it. Okay. Love it. Huh. So I guess without going too far into it, because Kat hasn't seen it, and I imagine a number mm-hmm. of other folks haven't had a chance yet. La, la, yeah. la, 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 la. I wouldn't dare mess was, it up for anyone who hasn't seen it. I, yeah, what I was too the, much respect for you. Uh, what was the difference? Was it just a terrible story, uh, character arcs you didn't like, too much going on? I think on, Afterlife was so good, Yeah. and mm. this was not a logical follow-up to that film. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yep. situations and people being places were forced and there was there were too many characters that were necessary that just had to be here because they were in the last one and it felt mm. we didn't spend enough time on the most important characters and ah. it, it felt cluttered to me yeah so and for you the most important characters is that the new team or is that the original uh, ghostbusters no 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 for this story it's no. it's not one team or the other it's what okay. characters were needed for this story Right. right. The, the, okay. Some of some of each. Some of each. Right. Yeah. So okay. I, I don't want to go gotcha. too much deeper because I honestly, I, I, I'm a, being big glib about it. I enjoyed the film, but not mm-hmm. nearly as much as I did Afterlife. Mm-hmm. And I have very specific reasons for that. But it's <clears throat> that's all. Yeah. Yeah. You, you will likely enjoy it if you're a Ghostbusters fan. But it's it won't it won't be your number one. <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I read. The, okay. I heard. I saw the dumbest. What I thought was the dumbest review of somebody online, and they literally said oh. that, John. No, I'm, I'm not putting you in that category. But this review was. <laughs> they summed up the review like this. This is how they concluded: If you're a fan of Ghostbusters, chances are you're gonna love this movie. If you're not a fan <laughs> of Ghostbusters, you won't like it. No shit. I mean, that's yeah, the, yeah. That's the tautology. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. If like so it, if, like I, it, if I could. If I could focus a little narrower, what I will say is if you are a fan of Afterlife, mm-hmm. you will likely find problems with this as being the follow up to that film. Hmm. In, in, okay. in, a, in the sequence of Ghostbusters films, this feels there are pieces that feel forced yeah. and not necessary. Mm-hmm. Therefore, make kind of they kind of put a little shadow on Afterlife for me because I'm like, yeah. really? That's how you move on from there? That's it. That's all. That's all. I can so. see that. I, I can see what you're saying, John. Yeah. And again, yeah. without revealing anything, folks seeing the trailer, mm-hmm. they go back to New York City. And you're right. Thinking about what I, ex- when, now you remind me of what my expectations were following uh, Afterlife. Mm-hmm. You're right. Where it seems like they're trying to reset now and just make space for a new, like we wish we would have made a Ghostbusters 3, 4, and 5 back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That said, mm-hmm. uh, my short review is I, I did I did have problems with it too, but I wouldn't call it a dumpster fire, and ultimately <laughs> I did enjoy it. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Yeah. I, I, it was fine. I thought it was fine. That but just makes for a great it. thumbnail, <laughs> and it rhymes. <laughs> it's, it's fine. It really. Was fine. Yeah. I'll probably love it. <laughs> so we'll have quite the spectrum yeah, of reactions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> certainly. Certainly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Brandon says, I plan on taking my son to see Frozen Empire soon because he's starting spring break. Nice to share a love of the franchise from father to son, even if the new one isn't as great. You remind me, Brandon, mm-hmm. I took my youngest with me to see it, and my wife, we went as well. Mm-hmm. And my youngest loved it. And in oh. part for her, it's because, look, she loves the original films. She really yeah. loves them. And in fact, when she'd see Bill Murray or Dan Aykroyd in another movie when she was smaller, she'd be like, mm-hmm. hey, that's Venkman, or hey, that's oh. Stevens, you know? That was how <laughs> she knows them. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. after uh, mm-hmm. Afterlife, she's kind of, there's more space for her, but she relates more to the young McKenna Grace character mm-hmm. because they're closer mm-hmm. in age. And so these are becoming like her Ghostbusters. Oh, that's and so, so cool. For, for her, having seen them in short order within the last couple of years, it, it's become hers in a way that it isn't mine. Right. Whereas more like the mind of John between the space and between the way they've sort of, you know, unfolding the story. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I might not feel as connected to it. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of forced. Mm-hmm. Keith says he just saw it with the family. I loved homages to all things in the 1984 movie. Yeah, I do like those oh. two. I don't think that was too terribly over the top or, you know, fan servicey, mm-hmm. but some of it was a little bit. Um, yes, well, I agree. still, it won't surprise you, though, that the domestic sales uh, are just barely ahead of Afterlife, which earned $44 million. Uh, 
when mm. it first started. Now, Afterlife had it against it, though, the pandemic, because we were still in recovery mode when that film came out. True. So these numbers are generally thought about as weaker and maybe a sign, at least according to some, as uh, maybe the, you know, uh, the power of this franchise waning. Because um, hmm. you hmm. need to convert new people to it. What it's yeah. showing is, yeah. is that uh, the folks that are interested in, like, you know, like this, like the three of us represented here, have a various mm-hmm. level of how much will be committed to a new, the new movies as they move on. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, other people are probably old and dying off. I mean, as far as fans go. <laughs> so, and it'll be us before people. too long. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> gotta bring in new blood. <laughs> but this also won't surprise you that no, none of the Ghostbusters films after the first have managed to topple its earnings, which mm-hmm. were $295 million worldwide uh, to date. Uh, Ghostbusters 2, which came out just a few years after that, uh, made 215. The 2016 reboot made 229, and Afterlife made 203 million dollars. Sure, mm-hmm. look, they've all made over 200 million dollars, so they're not worried for cash. And obviously, mm-hmm. it's led to animated shows, at least two that I could think of off the top of my head: video games, mm-hmm. tons of toys. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a whole life. All uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Now, were all those numbers? I don't know if you know what you're reading from. Are those adjusted for inflation, or in their day they each made 200 million or something? Because that would make yeah. Ghostbusters yeah. one and two much more impressive by comparison. <laughs> you know, I, you know, offhand, yeah. what I remember about Ghostbusters, I don't think this was adjusted because I think okay. when you adjust it, it's closer to half a billion dollars. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's uh, what I recall so at least. makes it still. But in, in your fact, day, making that much money, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I want to say, I do recall, this is just off the top of my head, it was neck and neck with, I think Hangover had maybe surpassed it, but maybe not as the highest grossing comedy of all time oh when my. adjusted for inflation. Ghostbusters is either probably still today, either one or two. Yeah. Hmm. All right. And hey, finally, in 1980s news, mm-hmm. uh, as reported by Variety, John Williams made a musical mistake uh, in A New Hope. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no, really no. <laughs> but maybe it wasn't his fault. Yeah, that's right. Let's right. find out here. Let's so this out. year, uh, Williams is resetting the record books again. We've talked about this once before when he made it when he was nominated, I believe, for a Dial of Destiny. He was already the second most uh, Academy Award nomination earningest person that was not named Walt <laughs> Disney. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> this is uh, it's his fifty fourth nomination. Now, wow. wait a second. Sorry, I can't be right. Oh no, that's what he's being nominated for now. Hmm. Scratch that. I think it was for the um, was that Steven Spielberg movie? What was that about? But it's about him growing up. That was the movie that it was. Uh, oh, was the, uh, the Felderman's? Fablemans. The Fablemans. Fablemans. There we go. Yeah. I was yeah. so close. Thank you. I think that's the one. But anyway, look, he's been he's been a. He's been a record setter for a period of time now. But anyway, this is his 54th nomination for uh, Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny. Uh, mm-hmm. In December, after seeming to suggest that he was retiring after scoring the uh, latest indie film, Williams uh, backed, uh, walked back previous reports that he'd put down his baton for the final time, saying, quote, I don't care much for grand uh, pronunciamentos. Indi- <laughs> Pronunciamentos. Oh, pronunciamentos. I, I thought I wrote this wrong. Pronunciamentos. Why is he throwing it? Was it? Yeah, was he was saying it in Spanish all of a sudden? I don't care much for grand pronunciamentos. Um, or or does, did he stutter? Does he not like Mentos? Does he just like the reaction with Diet Coke? Because they gave away the crime, his crimes. No, oh. Mentos won't give away oh. your crimes. They can put that on the package. Oh, Mentos. Right. We won't give, fresh into your breath, won't give that's away right. your crimes. <laughs> anyway, I don't care much for grand uh, pronouncements. Statements that are yeah, firm say. and finished and surrounded by closed doors. If I made one without putting it in the context, if I made one without putting it in context, then I withdraw it. Mm-hmm. So he unretired, if he ever did retire. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, even though he's, he's not ready to surrender the staff-lined uh, paper and pencil which, which, with which he's written his scores, Williams, who's now 92, is also the oldest person to be nominated for an Oscar. Awesome. National treasure. Mm-hmm. Now, if you mm-hmm. ask him uh, what the 54 nominations mean to him, he says, quote, well, I've lost 49 of them. Oh. Man. <laughs> oh. so, uh, the fact that he's counting right. tells you what he thinks <laughs> he's keeping track. but i'm not you know, bitter he, yeah well he does go on to say how and i do believe him in this regard 
He says that's just to get nominated, and that sounds like bullshit already. But just to get nominated, yeah. it requires yeah. a process of his peers saying mm -hmm. they believe he's worthy of the award. Mm -hmm. So to his point, having other folks who are lovers of music or composers themselves being able to say or saying this guy should get a, a, an award for mm -hmm. him, he's flattered that people even yeah. think of him that in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but the five films he did win win for include Jaws, Star Wars, E.T. Schindler's List, and Fiddler on the Roof, uh, for mm -hmm. which he he not only did an original score, but he also adapted uh, music from the original musical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the time, G George Lucas asked him to compose for Star Wars, the romantic style of Williams was no longer in vogue. Mm -hmm. It was something we had heard in the swashbuckly, swashbuckly adventure films of the mm -hmm. say 30s, maybe early 40s. Mm -hmm. But uh, during the 1970s, when we had these, uh, you know, grittier films, more artsy films, folks weren't scoring, uh, you know, the movie from, uh, you know, title card to end credits anymore. Mm -hmm. um, while speaking with Variety from his office, which is, which uh, includes a, his office, which includes a frame, which is, <laughs> while speaking with Variety from his office, uh, which is framed with a vintage poster from 1938's The Adventures of Robin Hood. Oh. Just a side note, I love that movie. That's a fantastic movie. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, we were talking about Orson Welles last week with some groundbreaking you know, cinematography. This has got some amazing mm -hmm. stuff in it too, including a oh. very memorable sword fight scene that's done a lot of it in shadow. You know, oh. There, you know. Anyway. Cool. But that, oh. Interesting. That mm -hmm. film, the poster is hanging there, uh, is one with uh, for which Eric Wolfgang Korngold won an Oscar for his music. So he's honoring this mm. other award-winning composer. Yeah. I'm going to come back to this composer in just a couple of minutes here. Ooh. Yeah, you seem anyway, like uh, you're, you're, you know, spinning he's, something. He's here. building to something. Yeah. Yeah. He is. But. But. <laughs> but according to Williams, he said, quote, George was very clear to me that the music should be symphonic. I took it mm. to mean late century, maybe European. Mahler, Wagner, Strauss, that period of orchestral writing. Mm. Quote. There was one blip, however, as we alluded to with the title of this uh, news hmm. piece here, is hmm. in scoring the first Star Wars film. According to Williams, he mistakenly wrote a love theme for Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. Mistakenly? <laughs> yes. Because as he explains, quote, I learned later that they were brother and sister. Right. So it was. So incestual. did we. Later. <laughs> Yeah. So it was an incestuous idea to have a love theme for them. But George never told us yeah, there right was going to be a Go. second film, end quote. I didn't know it at the time. And... Right. Oh. Yeah. I it's, mean... it's too faceted. It's like, first of all, let's mm. assume we did know. We didn't. Yeah. I, I'm still convinced Lucas didn't know. He, he was making it up as he went. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've learned much of that. Let's yes. assume that that everybody did know yeah well if you did a like boom chicka boom chicka, like little brother sister tune there it would have diffused the <laughs> the mystery of that love triangle and would it would, have, it would foreshadowed that they were siblings uh -huh. so you wouldn't want to do that that's mm. not what happened I mean, i'm sure what happened was he's like you know well there's these two on screen and williams said well give me some backgrounds like well it's those two lucas didn't yeah. know and so he's like well love theme i guess I'm sure, yeah, John Williams is blameless in his, uh, even yeah. though he admits he made the mistake, I don't think he did. Yeah. <laughs> Two yeah, things. Yeah. One, yeah. I want, I really want that to be our theme song, John, that boom chicka boom chicka boom, -chicka, boom -chicka, whatever you do there. <laughs> That's our sibling theme song. Okay, one. Wait, no, no, Kat, you don't want that. Do you know what John was suggesting? Well, oh. That was like a porn theme. No, 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 no. Right? I, it was a bouncy kind of oh, sibling like song. Boom, That's all. Boom. No, I would have done that. Right. There'd have been way more synth. Okay, in it. No. all right. I take it back. If you watched it, I was mistaken. Going, like, I didn't know you guys were brother and sister. I just learned that. <laughs> okay, you just found out all new information. Yes. But also, yes, I agree. When I wasn't giggling, I was trying to like follow John, and I. It, what is that? That <laughs> that that love triangle. Like it, oh, it makes it so much more like interesting and complex. Like that mm -hmm. has to be there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, and even Luke didn't know, and Leia didn't know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so no, none of us right. knew. Literally zero people <laughs> in the real or fictional <laughs> world were aware of that until the second movie was coming. So, yes. And actually, they didn't find out to the third film, Return of the Jedi. 
Right. And as John alluded, it's likely Lucas didn't know himself uh, that the the origin (laughs) of the twins Uh because it's in this second film, uh, in the second film, rather, Empire Strikes Back, that they kiss. Right. Um, And Mm -hmm. unlike the good luck peck uh, that Leia plants uh, on his uh, cheek during the uh, during A New Hope, the Smoochin Empire has more tongue than the special edition Sarlacc. Oh, oh, I mean, they, oh my. Like they kind of go for it. <laughs> oh, 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 my goodness. <laughs> now, if knowing uh, their relationship now gives you this high, John getting props, which John getting? No, oh. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you get to it. All right, I'll let you get to it. And if knowing their relationship <laughs> makes the latter, uh, that latter PDA seem cringe, it could have been worse, it turns out. Because thanks to a deleted scene uh, released uh, on Disney Plus in November of 2019, we now know the relationship between Luke and Leia was almost more romantic. Oh. Mm-hmm. And while the kiss, really? uh, the kiss as it's seen in the theatrical version seems as if Leia is only intending to make Han jealous, mm-hmm. the original footage shows it follows a near profession of Luke's love for Leia. Oh, wow. And after being, after being, I'll just set it up, and then I'm going to show you the clip here. After being oh. removed from the back to chamber, you know he's in the back to chamber. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. After the yes. getting surviving the the wampa. Yes. Uh, he's uh, Le- Leia re- visits Luke uh, by his uh, bedside. Okay. The back is growing real well. The scars ought to be gone in a day or so. Does it hurt? Nah, I'm fine. Leia. When I was out in that storm, I, I was real worried. You were worried. <laughs> it got me thinking, you know. I might never get the chance. What? Tell me. Oh, that's good. It's so good to see you for the function of the Thanks, 3 I'll be back later. <laughs> wow. Of course, wow. C-blocker or C-3PO blocker comes right in <laughs> and uh, prevents them from kissing. Mm. But watching that, and no, I don't know if it's just only because I know what I know about them then, I feel really mm. uncomfortable. Like, mm. you know, it feels like, I mean, you could. it feels different than the version that we're given, obviously, right? I don't. What's the, I'm just, I'm, I just got a note here from George Lucas. It says, oh, oh. <laughs> it says he had always intended for them oh. to have an incestuous relationship, but they didn't have the filmmaking technology back when he okay. first made the films. <laughs> well, crap. Now we know what's coming. <laughs> Misa thinks he's going to add in a CGI layer. Oh, man. I was getting busy. Yes. Get that R rated Star Wars. <laughs> I didn't feel uncomfortable watching that because I maybe no. I don't know maybe I'm able to just separate it out. It's like this is when they don't know this. You know, <laughs> I, you're doing I, a mantra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I just go I'm along place, for the ride. Placing yeah. myself, you know, at that point in time, and mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not maybe, thinking about the other one. Maybe, yeah. Mm. Maybe he was just going to tell her a secret, like the Empire's really bad. <laughs> you know. <laughs> He wasn't going to kiss. He was just getting close to tell her a super secret. That's or something about Wampas that he learned. He was going to talk about 3PO. That's why they shut up when he came in. Exactly. <laughs> oh, there he is. No, no, no. Exactly what happened. <laughs> Michael says, so Luke shot first. Oh. We get, a lot of, we get a lot of mileage out of someone in Star Wars shooting first. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right? All the time. <laughs> Let me check to see if those settings are still. Okay, very good. They're still the same. Um, fortunately, you know, it's sort of what John's alluding to is that Lucas didn't scrub the romantic theme music out of future releases of the film, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. he did, you know, with uh, the Han Mm -hmm. Solo uh, uh, drawing his blaster first on Greedo. But but realizing the error of his ways, he gave Williams an opportunity to write Carrie Fisher a new non-incestuous theme for the Empire Strikes Back. What is that? What is it? No telling? trombones. No yes. trombones. Yes. Yep. That's right. 
It's all strings and flutes. No saxophones. Wow, no, wow, wow. <laughs> no sexy careless whisper sax. Is <laughs> cat draping or Leia draping? Oh, draping, draping across, across the speaker. More trombone. Mm-hmm. She drapes across R2, D2, or something. <laughs> Whatever nearby. Whatever gadget is nearby. <laughs> Whatever gadget is nearby. Okay. Cat. And in That's Empire Strikes show. Back, so not only does John Williams uh, compose a new theme for, for Leia, mm. it's the first time that he creates a motif for Darth Vader. Mm. Yeah, that's right. You don't hear the Imperial March until the Empire Strikes Back. Get out of town. Really? What? Yeah. Huh. Is this the, the Mandela first... effect or something? <laughs> mm-hmm. I know. Don't you swear yeah. when he comes in at the beginning of New Hope? I, I would have said yes. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Oh. The first time we hear it is some piccolos that are playing when they fire off the... Uh, the probe droids to find them what planet that the oh. rebels are hiding on Piccolo's, we don't huh? hear the f- oh. full vader theme until about 20 minutes into the film when darth vader is mm-hmm. shown for the first time you know what i was thinking of cerveza yeah. cristal that was yes, the theme that's that right was... <laughs> see john you've only seen that version <laughs> that's my problem yeah, yeah. yeah. So i can't speak for that <laughs> now it, uh, i mentioned for uh, early on that uh let's see where we go here we go I mentioned early on that the John Williams in his office has this poster of the adventures of Robin Hood hanging for mm-hmm. which composer uh, Eric uh, Wolfgang uh, Korngold uh, won an Academy Award. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play you another piece of music that Korngold wrote a clip. Oh, here we go. For which Korngold <laughs> wrote a clip. And damn it, I forgot to write the name down. So oh, no. <laughs> so it's not the adventures of Robin Hood, though. Make it up. It's, uh, Pretend. Just make up a name. Yeah, it's it's something about the new somebody or others. Ah, I don't remember. There you go. Whatever. <laughs> right. I'm not even going to try to find it. Anyway, huh. here's a clip from uh, one of Corn Gold's pieces of music. This is from a uh, 19 so uh, whatever. <laughs> it's something. I'll, I'll look it up. But it's all out the that's window. That's not the important part. Here, don't get to too specific on it. Just us, listen please. to Corn Gold. <laughs> Ooh. What? Sound familiar to you at all? There's about a there's about a dozen or so <laughs> classical compositions or compo- or compositions like that. Interpolation. <laughs> yes. yes. Or, or there's or, or songs from other films that John Williams was clearly inspired by, and if I played them side mm-hmm. by side, mm. you would be shocked how similar uh those are wow i don't want to shock you oh oh, no, oh never you never want yeah. to shock us never yes shock he us. was you know <laughs> if he had the poster i'm guessing it was a composer that he idolized or admired yeah. or mm-hmm. something and so mm-hmm. borrowing from those sorts of themes i didn't so much notice mm-hmm. the theme but the um the mm. uh, uh uh what's the word i'm looking for orchestration like the, right. the instruments yeah. that are in use yeah. it was like oh that's that, that williams horn sound that br- 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 mm-hmm. that kind of like tr- yeah. fanfare in there i can yep. see the inspiration i can i see i can hear the inspiration i can't see anything it's music but yeah. fanfare that was a good word for it there mm-hmm. was, it was mm-hmm. some kind of there was a feeling even before I caught the do 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 do. You know right. that there was right. like right. that, that, that proclamation sound yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. nice yeah. yeah that, that, Full circle, Will. Well that music is the main title from uh, King's Row. Oh, King's Row. you found it. All right. Yeah, I did. All right. <laughs> I hey. was say whatever it was called, whatever it was would. made, we have yeah. no idea. <laughs> we could do a whole episode on playing those side by side, but you could just Google it on the internet, find it on YouTube. Well, that's All right. Hey. Future. What's that? <laughs> that's for the future. That's for a future episode. <laughs> yes. Or a long time ago. Hey, that was oh. 1980s news. <laughs> All right, hey, let's talk about this. Mm. By this, I mean Roadhouse. Yes, let's talk about this. Roadhouse. Mm. I so, got notes. <clears throat> oh, good. Is that what your little book was for, too? Notes? I have a big book. For oh, God. <laughs> you, Kat, you just start on your notes. John and I will, will join you when you're done. You're just going to kick back <laughs> <laughs> and sip your drink. Well, we want to get through the show on time. I yeah. It's very How many sketchy. pages of notes? How I don't. Pages? It's nothing. I don't have paragraphs. I have. I have a chart, and I have lines. You see how she's not answering the question. Yeah, yeah. How many pages? It's a very of direct, notes? simple question. One, 
Ooh, oh, when? all right. Why do you just say that instead of <laughs> deflecting? I think <laughs> I, I was feeling defensive. And ah. I, couldn't answer the question right away. Sure. One, it's double spaced, wide margins. <laughs> one oak tag sized page. It's like John's Christmas list. <laughs> when he was a kid. The poster gonna, board. Yeah. yeah yes. She's going to check them off as she gets up. Says her names. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Let's just start with the basics here. Hey, the original film that we first fell in love with, either in video or, or in the actual theaters, and I'm guessing most people probably discovered it mostly uh, after it became available on cable TV mm -hmm. and on videotape, it could be rented because it really took off at that point. But it was came out in 1989. Mm -hmm. Of course, it starred Patrick Swayze, mm -hmm. Kelly Lynch, Sam Elliott, uh, Ben Gazzara. Marshall mm -hmm. Teague is the is the the bad uh, right hand man that gets uh, his throat ripped out at the end of the movie. Um, <laughs> Terry Funk, wrestler Terry Funk, is in there. He's uh, mm -hmm. one of the bouncers that gets fired. Mm. Um, it was uh, directed mm -hmm. by Rowdy Harrington and co-written by R. Lance Hill, who we, we just talked about, has a lawsuit pending right now with uh, the current producers of, of Roadhouse. Yeah. Because he says they used AI to finish the film to avoid uh, being able, be, being required to transfer the copyrights back to him. And it was mm -hmm. co-written with uh, him by him and Hillary Henkin. Um, mm -hmm. On a budget of $15 million, it made $61 million. Wow. It currently holds a 41% on Rotten Tomatoes, which, you know, yeah. it's not terrible, but uh, it only... okay. is it <laughs> like I haven't looked at the Rotten Tomatoes page. Is it one of those where like critics 41 and audiences like 75 or something? Yeah, is it one of those yeah. deals? Yeah, yeah, I bet it yeah, is. Most likely it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it's a 41 film, but if you enjoy it, it's a 70 something film. Really? Sure. It's, it's yeah. one of those yeah. Ghostbusters review. If you like it, you're going to like it. If you don't like it, you're going to hate it. You might not like it as much. Yeah. Um, but I liked it. Look, we all, we, we, and the three of us have watched the originals and the latest ones within the last, I don't know, 30 days or so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And the actually the I old know. one, the original mm -hmm. one, I just, for the first time I saw it about a month ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. When okay. I fell in love with it. Yeah. What Very I would nice. like to do is give you the, the stats for the new film, and then let's just talk about them. Let's compare, mm -hmm. contrast. Mm hmm uh, and we can talk about our relative enjoyment of, uh, of the, the, the both of them as well. With regard mm -hmm. to the new film, it was just it just came out. It's on Amazon Prime right now. It stars Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Jessica Williams, uh, Daniela Mal Malchior, Billy Mengeson, Conor McGregor, and others. It was directed by Doug Lyman, who you might know. He directed he, he directed Swingers, I believe. Yeah, Swingers, mm -hmm. uh, The Bourne Identity. You, you, you read, one of my favorites, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, which you might know as Live, Die, and Repeat, because they tried to rebrand yeah, it. Yeah, Because nobody knew yep. what Edge of Tomorrow meant. Hmm. And if you it was recall, the, uh, the sci-fi Groundhog sequel, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I love that remake. Yeah. Okay. It's a kind of movie, that one. I've had people visit, and they're like, hey, you want to watch a movie? I'm like, Shh, I've got one to show you if you haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah, I've done I bet you like haven't seen this people. one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Will you do that to me next time? <laughs> yeah. Next if you want, time yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. Yeah. Come down to Florida. We'll watch it here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Road trip. It's just a couple of months ago before the movie came out, Doug Lyman said it may be his very best film he's ever made. Now, a lot of directors mm. talk up their films before they come out. Mm. So uh, I think we could talk about whether or not the, how that stacks up to the other films I just mentioned. Uh, on a, uh, We don't know the budget of this film. I don't know it. And, and, and we certainly don't know the box office because it's a streamer. It's a streamer. And they don't tell a shit about those in, in part yeah. because i don't think they want the creatives to know right because then they got to start cutting checks which is you know part of the whole strike was about recently so there's probably some more accountability but look we, we get these box office numbers re you know released from the uh you know the actual physical theaters why can't mm -hmm. we have something similar like this but they're they're not doing it uh, well i will Tomatoes, tell you yeah when when i went to watch it yeah. i it said it was the number one uh movie on amazon that everyone oh, was yeah? watching that yeah. day or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what mm -hmm. the hell long a period they look at. That it, it popped right up. I didn't even have to search for it. It's number one stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, currently on Rotten Tomatoes, and again, obviously, as John pointed out, there's you know this isn't. I'm just trying to give us uh, you know some level baseline. sort of yeah. comparison. Yeah. Sure. It's mm -hmm. got a 68 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons why that could be different and have not as much to do or less to do with the quality of the films because mm -hmm. we're talking about what uh, you know it's it's a contemporary film being reviewed by contemporary reviewers who mm -hmm. have different tastes and expectations yeah. and, and so on and so forth and that feels yeah. low to me is that right okay 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you said the same thing about the original too. You thought that felt low as well, right? Yeah, 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 for different reasons. I think that is that's a better film in the glow of nostalgia than it really right. is. Whereas I think this is a strong film on its own. Right. AKA not a dumpster fire. No. Right. <laughs> no. Now, I should point out for folks who haven't seen the film, that's probably the safest amount of information we're gonna give. Can't yes. guarantee you we won't give you any spoilers going forward as we talk about some of the yeah. plot points and some of the mm-hmm. uh, performances and so on and so forth. I don't know that anything I'm going to say is terribly spoilery, but there's a couple things that I think mm. probably Cat are. looks guilty. Like I many think... of her bullet points are spoilery. Uh, they yeah, all I die. Don't... They all die. It's a simulation. I can't keep it in anymore. <laughs> oh, I'll try not to. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So how can she's, we go about She's this? striking yeah. off. She's like, can't talk about that. Can't talk about yeah. that. Can't talk about <laughs> So... Uh, I guess I guess as another sort of baseline, I'll just say this because they have this uh, just a quick summary, two sentence summary of, of, of both films because they do have they have a I'm talking about DNA earlier. There's definitely a DNA that's ninety nine point percent nine percent similar, but it is that three million of the three billion point one percent that's different. Uh-huh. <laughs> Check, I don't know if any of that math checks out. I love it. Uh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> love it. Well, yeah. The so the general premise carries over. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, there's definitely things where you feel like, haven't I seen this before? And you have, Mm -hmm. but there Mm -hmm. are little nuances Mm -hmm. that they change. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But the the old film, Dalton, played by Swayze as a professional bouncer, Mm -hmm. was working security for a club in New York City when he's approached by a businessman from Missouri to come over and work for him at his uh, roadhouse, uh, the Double Deuce in Jasper, Mm -hmm. because he wants to clean it up. He wants to spend money and, and, and... invest a significant amount of money making it a real destination but he can't because there's a bunch of assholes that mm-hmm. just this is something we got to talk mm-hmm. about too like do places like this exist where people just go like <laughs> out of their fucking minds and need to kill people like that scene in the uh sequel to uh what was that the uh, uh matthew vaughn movies about the secret agent uh huh. i think it's the um, second one matthew vaughn uh uh gentleman of I that something is. i got nothing now somebody yeah. knows. They'll tell me. Okay. Somebody in the comments um, will know. <laughs> anyway, so there. So that's the first one. And then the most recent one, it's a little different because instead of having a professional bouncer, we have a, I, I guess you could mm-hmm. say, retired UFC fighter uh, played by Jake uh, Gyllenhaal, who's also a Dalton, although he has a different first name. And mm-hmm. it seems like at this point in his life, he, he's living uh, by, by scamming people at underground fights. Yes. Because... <laughs> yes. Uh, Unlike the Patrick Swayze character, and we'll talk about this, who is only known within the business as a mm-hmm. mysterious yeah. sort of figure, mm-hmm. uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's character is known worldwide because he's a mm-hmm. guy who's fought on you know these uh, UFC fights and presumably pay per view. And here comes mm-hmm. some spoilers for you: he killed a guy during a match, mm-hmm. and so all he has mm-hmm. to do now is show up on the ground. I guess yes. so. That's... He certainly did something to him that was very damaging. Did they actually oh, say he killed him? Yeah, they. Yeah. yeah. Him. Did they? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I missed that one line. I know they said that's the one that did yeah. it. Well, I don't know what it. If they defined it, was oh, he paralyzed he, no. or something? You know what I mean? Yeah. Hmm. They didn't say you killed a guy. Hmm. That out there. All right. They said, "Oh, I think that's the punch that did it." Yeah, yeah. and I think well. I mean, we could it, talk about. You it. could be right. You could be right. Yeah. I wasn't certain, but but w- w- while I. You mentioned the the bouncer thing. Yeah. Um, so one thing they chose to get rid of in this new one is the original Roadhouse was not, not that they were setting up a cinematic universe, but there was this John Wick esque brotherhood of people that were bouncers. Mm. You had a mentor, and you had this guy, people that knew each other, and they were inside, like you said, Will, of their little bubble. That's who knew you, and other people mm-hmm. didn't. And they discarded mm-hmm. the whole bouncer mystique in that kind of universe of, you know, the bouncer code and whatever. He's just a, a wild card in this one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, the, and the John Wick universe you're referring to is the original film from 89, not the current one, right? right. Just to be. Yes, right. The to original one, right. Yeah, the original it, one was setting up like, like John Wick has the Society of Killers yeah. and Swayze's okay. film had like the Society of Bouncers. That's it, correct. <laughs> yeah, you remind me, there was like a straight to video Roadhouse 2 that was, <laughs> his son was a bouncer. <laughs> oh, and really? And the original Dalton played one. by Patrick Swayze was explained that had, had got shot in the face and died like, uh, you know, off screen before this story unceremoniously that's anyway so there was the for the for the the world the franchise building that they did 
Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. So there you go. So, mm-hmm. are there any other? Let me see. What else did I write here? Oh, so yeah. So he he's this underground. He, he's he's grifting people in these underground fights by just showing up. Yeah. People yes. see mm-hmm. him and they don't want to fight him, so they he winds up winning by default because they know <laughs> they know his reputation. You know. Right. But he gets approached similarly by someone who has a bar that needs to be cleaned up and gets hired away from there. Hmm. So mm-hmm. high level, you know. Again, there's a lot of things that are you feel like this is familiar, like deja vu. But yes. there's enough changes to make it fresh and interesting. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Although I don't agree with, like John's alluding to, some of the things. I don't agree with some of the changes they made, and I'm not sure why they mm. did. Oh, interesting. Okay. Huh. But, um, I'd be curious. All right, to so that's know. high level. So again, yeah, we can get wonky now. I think. <laughs> Let's get wonky. <laughs> um, and I think John alluded yeah. to the first thing that we could talk about is the the, the sort of just the basic uh, sort of nature of these diff- of these two characters. I. Love. We talked about this briefly uh, in some context not too long ago, but I love the fact that they have this bouncer world in the original film, mm-hmm. and I love that part of it is that this, cool. or this bar world. Mm-hmm. The part of it is this like lone gunman, this guy mm-hmm. without a name. In fact, he only has a last name in the movie. They yeah, even say his first name. That he travels from place to place, cleaning mm-hmm. up towns essentially. Mm-hmm. You know, which mm-hmm. feels very western to me, and I love westerns. Uh-huh. And and I think this is probably consistent with the you know uh, sort of the look of the cowboys were the heroes of, of of westerns were they were handsome and good looking and they didn't necessarily look like they could you know kick your ass let alone kill you <laughs> and Patrick Swayze fit that bill uh huh uh-huh. and then you contrast that with Jake Gyllenhaal within the first five minutes of the movie he takes off his hoodie and even if you don't know any of the backstory i just told you he is ripped yes. <laughs> he is tatted up and uh-huh. they show you immediately that a guy who just you know nearly beat somebody to death is afraid of him yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah so already at the beginning i don't i don't i don't like that i think it makes it a weaker sort of story you just made me think mm-hmm. though you referenced yeah. the western and also um I guess this, I don't know if this is a spoiler. Remember how he makes the decision to go uh, to this place that the woman came and wanted to mm-hmm. recruit him for. He he did not immediately want to go. In fact, he didn't want anything to do with it. Right. But he had an emotional crisis. He, uh, you know, <laughs> made a decision and realized, oh, my God, I shouldn't <laughs> I shouldn't do this. Yeah. And then, of course, he didn't have a car and he needed money. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he had to take her up on uh, her her offer, and and then not long after, that that western theme is introduced by a character mm-hmm. that he meets That's where right. he goes. The um, it, you know, I forget how it comes about, but he, I feel like it's almost like this is the beginning of his path, oh, possibly okay. oh. into that world. Mm, so with Swayze. That's that Dalton was already there, and maybe, maybe it, this is like an origin story in a way, mm. and and he's going to be mm. able to do what Swayze did. You know, the very things, Will, that you explained that you liked Swayze's Dalton better because of mm. they set up. I like Gyllenhaal's Dalton. Mm. Okay, for the same I, reasons that you like Swayze's, huh. I appreciated that he wasn't aloof and unapproachable. Mm. Right. We see him, yes, he's grifting people, uh, fine, whatever, but he's not just doing a job. You get to see him be kind to people yes. and take care of them simply because he likes them. There's there's mm-hmm. the shop that's just up the street from the roadhouse that you'll you see mm-hmm. early on in the film, mm-hmm. and he meets mm-hmm. this young family there, a, a father and a daughter that run this bookshop, mm-hmm. and he cares about them, not because they're paying him, because he right. believes in what's right. Right. And so I felt he had a, a greater moral compass than just my job is bouncer. Mm-hmm. Hall's Dalton was more of a hero. And in fact, he has the hero switch that you throw like Popeye's spinach. If oh. you get him mad enough, he's going to hulk out. Yeah. And so I like that he almost was not in control of mm-hmm. the thing that he did. When he gets too mad, he's kind of whatever. But... Mm-hmm. It, it, he's more human. He's more compassionate. He's not a mercenary. He's mm-hmm. a guy 
who has made some mistakes and is down on his luck, but you see him be a good person and care about people, even when he's not being paid. I like that about the Jill and Hall Dalton. I love that about him too. I would I would argue that Swayze is not mercenary. You know, he he certainly has he shows many not, things. Not as much. Yeah. Well, it, sure. But he's um, more mercenary than yeah. Well, possibly, but he cares about the the farmhouse guy. You know, the farmer. Right. Uh, you know, he he helps him, and he he gets pissed off when you know the the his um his uh, yeah, the, landlord. Good point. Good point. <laughs> you know, yes, is yes. targeted. But yeah, yeah, I feel like the uh, the Gyllenhaal Dalton. Um, we, we there's more of an emotional layer there. There's there's more mm -hmm. complexity that we are are able. I cared to more see. about the person as opposed to the guy doing the job in sure. Swayze's. Yeah. yeah. And in yeah. the original one, there was also a store too. Remember that Doc's father has. Yes. That he. Mm -hmm. There's a store in both of them. Yeah. There, yes. There's. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chuck, DNA. Has trademark <laughs> Chuck has yep. trademarked the bouncer verse as uh, the world of. <laughs> there we go. The Roadhouse. I like it. Chuck. Like it yeah. Love it. <laughs> Miss Sosa, I always forgot about the sequel. Yeah. Uh, mm. For good reasons. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> good instincts. <laughs> yep. 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 Um, I just want to point out, uh, I love both of them. I love both okay. Dalton. <laughs> hmm. Or well, you know, d different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And look, I, I enjoyed both films. I enjoyed the new film. So, but but again, mm -hmm. I think I think, unlike what John's saying, I think you could, and I think you could have had both. I think you could have had him be this mysterious gunman that shows up to town to clean up things. And like we do with a lot of these Westerns, show that they have a heart and they care mm -hmm. about things, even if they're not getting paid to care about them. Mm -hmm. I do Could think have, they sure. did that with with uh, with uh, Patrick Swayze as well. But I, I, I know what you mean. There's some hilarious moments where he goes way oh. out of his way to take care of people. <laughs> oh and, and my we gosh! Do learn that oh. it's probably in direct reaction to him having killed somebody and him oh, trying yeah. to avoid mm -hmm. getting that angry ever again. You know, he's sort of you know pursuing peace. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I love that. Yes. Like as a reaction to that. And he's just so matter of fact about it. It's like, oh, oh, you, you have a concussion now. Let me, you know, <laughs> he just did it, but he, oh, you need to be treated now. Like he just, the, the way he, he, he follows up and deals with the aftermath that he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, so that reminds me of something else, Kat, is that mm -hmm. um, so often we see a trailer and uh -huh. you see an amazing scene in a trailer and then mm -hmm. you get to the film and you go, oh, here it comes. Right, and right. often I'm let down because I've already seen it. Yes, so right. I'm thinking of the first fight where he's like, I just smacked you. Are you okay? And it proceeds from there, right? <laughs> yes. And I had seen that scene, uh, seen right. that scene in the trailer, mm -hmm. and I was fearing, well, I've that's that's the good part. It continued <laughs> for a further seven minutes uh -huh. following that story of that oh. fight and the ramifications of it and mm -hmm. you know, little cute bits that I won't definitely won't spoil here just in case you're listening with spoilers yes that are just cute you're like oh look oh look who's involved now and in doing this you know it, it, it was more that's how i think more i, I really like Hall's dalton more in this film because mm -hmm. of how human and humorous he is mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. just having watched the original swayze was a little humorless he was well, yeah, yeah i agree he, he, i agree he, he was very yeah. dour yeah true yeah. true true yeah more stoic yeah. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and ultimately, look, it's just a difference in choice, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. but along those lines, you know, we're talking about these mm -hmm. distinctions, and you know, John likes the Gyllenhaal because he seems more human, etc. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe along those lines, you like this part of his portrayal better too. But I don't think Swayze had to be necessarily stoic to have this consistent with his character. But it does go mm -hmm. with the fact that he was a professional bouncer is that mm -hmm. when he comes to the double deuce he has a credo he has mm -hmm. a set of rules that he lives by he mm -hmm. trains the other boxers or bouncer mm -hmm. he trains the other bouncers mm -hmm. you know he famously tells them that he he wants them to be nice until it's time not to be nice uh -huh. i will tell you when it's time not to be nice yes <laughs> yeah he doesn't yeah. actually fight with anybody in the bar for the first uh, at least 24 hours i think mm -hmm. the first time we see him actually engage with someone is almost half hour in whereas mm -hmm. Hall's already beaten somebody up about 15 minutes into the movie <laughs> yeah i like well, how he comes the rules in this, of the bouncer verse that's how it goes yeah, so <laughs> but it's again i guess we're just talking about two different portrayals we're talking about a guy yeah. who's a seasoned professional who mm -hmm. you know is can see 
it's almost like a game to him or chess where he, you know, he can mm. anticipate how people are going to behave mm -hmm. and know how to effectively control them versus just punching. Jillian Hall is not as wild card as the villain in the film played by Conor McGregor that we'll talk about, mm -hmm. but he's, a, he's definitely more of a loose cannon. Yes. Yes. Who's at the beginning of his bouncer arc possibly <laughs> and yeah, yeah. if you if yeah if possibly. we just accept what you said cat at the thing you completely made up <laughs> then yes it, it just occurred to me something you said will but even though he's a wild card and he's not a bouncer he seems to inherently at the start of the well at the, at the start of his journey at the roadhouse he also seems to have a similar code sit mm. observe not no. engage wait yeah. until it's required take it outside he it's it's almost like in the the dna of these two films <laughs> yeah. that's in it that's a dominant gene that p persisted yeah. into the new one oh mm -hmm. uh, even though you're not a bouncer and we threw away that whole kind of arc you still need to have this sort of like wait stand back only act when it's necessary and he does that too i had considered that yeah yeah you know i think oh, maybe i totally. would yeah mm -hmm. no, this sorry. is just to be good go ahead no you go <laughs> <laughs> see this is just to be really wonky now is this the idea that I would have liked it better. Okay, he's not a seasoned bouncer, mm -hmm. but could he put it in the context of what he learned in MF MMA? Mm -hmm. You know that how he approaches those things because there's a lot of you know it's 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 a chess match when you're doing that. It's not yeah. just brawn. A lot of that is brains as well. Yeah, I, I would have felt a little. I don't know. I, I get the humane part, and we'd like him because he's very he's more like uh, relatable. Mm -hmm. But I guess I wanted to feel more like he was really good at what he did, and certainly demonstrates he's good at fighting, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I just wanted to point out how, yeah, it was, oh, he, he waited and waited and waited. He didn't get involved. And I was like, come on, man, this is what you're hired for. Get in there. <laughs> and he just, he, he didn't. So I, I didn't measure the amount of time, you know, that between mm -hmm. Swayze and Gyllenhaal. But to me, it felt like forever before he, <laughs> before he got involved. And he, yeah. I felt like, yeah, he's observing. He's just trying to assess the situation. Isn't, uh, I think mean, Gyllenhaal's Dalton was a little Reacher-ish in some ways too. They just, not, not in his, um, not so much in his appearance, but in his, I am a force to be reckoned with. I will stand by until I absolutely must engage. Mm. And I know I'm going to win. Kind of that, uh, that ominous confidence that Reacher has. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But yeah, and probably, uh, you know, I like Retro slightly better only because, again, I feel like he has a code. Mm -hmm. But we are to mm -hmm. intuit Jake's code, I suppose, except for yeah, the fact right. that we've seen he's a grifter and we know he's murdered somebody. Right. And <laughs> when the when she's asking him about the, the her, him do fight and killing somebody, she says, why did you do that to your friend? Hmm. Which makes it even, I don't know, more disgusting. Again, gross. did they define that? Yes, he killed Still. the guy. How do you know that? You just you're sure that's why you keep I'm certain? confident that if I Google something, there's someone that okay. really, there's something more. Okay. But we don't I, know for certain. I'm just saying they didn't say it. And if I he did murder someone, why yeah. is he not in prison? Again, not murder. It would oh, be Oh, John, that's that's how we know he didn't murder him because they explain how why he didn't go to jail. Hmm. Uh, oh, I'm just so typing, they, they say something about the intent. I just typing did Elwood Dalton and it says kill his friend came right up. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Everybody wants to know. Everyone. <laughs> I have no doubt he did something terrible to him. Brain damage, paralysis, Noah something. was a US, UFC fighter who killed his opponent in the ring. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. When I, I'll watch it again because I did enjoy it enough to watch it again. I want to look oh. for the evidence of that because <laughs> it, while it may have been in the mind of the director, I'm not certain they explicitly say that. Okay. But could, and, could be. And there's no doubt in my mind for some reason, but I couldn't tell you the line. Yeah, because Will told you. You just take everything Will says, face value. <laughs> mm -hmm. <There> you go. <laughs> As well you should. Anyway. He's usually right. <laughs> um, hey, let's talk about uh, the, uh, let's mm -hmm. see. Let's talk about, so we're talking about the, the, the fighting, I guess, generally. Let's talk about the fighting. Mm. Okay. Look, sure. there's, there's, there's aspects of this movie, the new film, that felt 1980s to me, in a sense. Because uh -huh. it uh -huh. didn't, I feel like today, and this began in the 80s, I want to say, with Sid Field and Lawrence Kasdan, really, and then folks that have followed them, really turning uh, scripts into, you know, formulas. By 20 minutes mm -hmm. in, X, 
by, mm -hmm. you know, then it, it's, Act 2 is around 45 pages. All these different, where you could track and watch a movie and look at your watch and know, <laughs> seriously, I've done this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This movie, it, it, earlier than that in the 80s, and not every movie in the 80s, but the ones that were like, you know, canon films, for example, I, they didn't track necessarily that way. This okay. felt more like that to me. And I want to oh. say in a, in, and maybe the original Roadhouse did too. And I want to say in a good way, yeah, you had your inciting incidents and all these kinds of things, but it felt like there, there were moments, and I'll just say like uh, with the with the uh, was it the alligator or crocodile? I don't know what the, which species mm -hmm. it is. Crocodile. Or stuff crocodile. like that would happen, and I felt like well, anything can happen. You know, it didn't feel mm -hmm. like it had to be necessarily part of the formula. Anyway, mm -hmm. that said, the one thing about this that wasn't eighties like, and there were many things, was the fights, and I actually appreciated it because unlike the first mm -hmm. film, which seemed like eighties fight scenes where it's choreographed and you mm -hmm. can almost see the breakaway table break before it breaks and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, the knife yeah, is rubber. You can see it move, right? <laughs> I really appreciated how this one was the, the stunt choreography, the fight choreography, mm. and how it was shot because there were oh, so Texas yes. switches and some things going on, but you yeah. wouldn't necessarily know because of the pacing and everything that made it look fantastic. Oh, yeah. we could talk I felt about like, the filming separately. Like the yeah, way the whole yeah. movie, there was some cool filming stuff. I don't normally notice that stuff. And I was like, whoa. Some <laughs> Sorry, of the fight God. scenes felt like like drone shots or like I mm. they, they taped a GoPro to a dragonfly and said, fly around these guys real fast. Yes. You know, and I'm sure it was probably a rig and something complicated, but I'm like, man, I, I feel like I'm zooming in and out of mm -hmm. Like it's an animated film where you can go anywhere because the camera was going around these guys in ways that like, where's the rigging? How are you getting all of these shots yeah, in right. one continuous no cut shot? It's pretty impressive. Yeah. And there's mirrors <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. Oh, yeah. And, and usually that so drives me crazy too. in movies when they do that, oh. but it didn't uh -huh. in this one. It, it just felt like it was, it was well, they were cut together in a way that matched the, you know, the pacing of the, the action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought of the GoPro thing, too. There was one spe specific point where I was like, oh, man, it's like we're being hit. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was uh, pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the fighting was brutal. You know, mm. in, in the first movie, it was, again, more cinematic in a way that feels safe. This was mm -hmm. brutal, you know, with people mm -hmm. getting stabbed and uh, oh otherwise gosh. injured in ways that was just rough. Mm -hmm. I appreciated that often when he was going to hurt someone, he yeah. told them what he was about to do. <laughs> you know, yeah. there, was a, there, there was a scene that, uh, spoiler in that it happens, but not plot points. He's mm. talking to a guy with a gun and mm. telling him, well, yeah. if this <laughs> finger was broken, you couldn't pick up. The, well, if they were both broken, you couldn't even squeeze the trigger. So that's probably what I'm going to have to do if you don't put the gun down. And you go, oh, you're a smart guy, huh? And it's like he does this like jujitsu, quick disarm him, grab him, break his fingers, <laughs> lay him on the ground and go, I told you there's a hospital just up the road. I know where it's at. Right. <laughs> 25 minutes away. <laughs> I love that about it, that he's yeah. he's like, look, I'm up front with you. It's not a surprise. You're about to get your ass beat. Would you like to get your ass beat or take a different path? And then when they don't, that's that code kicking in. He's like, look, yeah. I know I'm going to win, but here's your here's your chance to step away. And they yep. never did, of course. So Of course not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did enjoy that. And, and John, mm -hmm. without giving too much away, there's a scene where he tells somebody, what's happening to them. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what happened to his friend. I think that's what he did to his friend. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, You're going to feel this. It, this is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Which it makes it more okay. grotesque to me because there's a quick shot of what happens to his friend and it looks like yeah. the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll watch anyway, that next time I watch it. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's talk about some other actors, some other characters slash characters in this. And look, we can't. So again, t let's talk about the original first, I suppose. Okay. And uh, specifically the villains. We could talk about love mm. interests uh, too, but uh, specifically the villains. In the first movie, we had Ben Gazzara was the the rich guy pulling the strings, and I don't recall, and maybe you guys do. In, in the in the new movie, the, the the rich villain is is motivated by land. He the the the, the yes. roadhouse is the lone holdout mm -hmm. in the stretch of it's land in the way. that he owns. Yeah, mm -hmm. he wants to convert it all into I don't know some sort of they say something for rich assholes. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, something. a resort condos or something. Or, yeah, yeah. Resort. I don't yeah. remember why Ben Gazzara wants to get rid of Patrick Swayze's Dalton, except that he's. Hmm. Uh, he, he's he's hurt his henchmen and other guys, you know, and his, his nephew was the bartender that got fired, that sort of thing. Mm. But Ben Gazzara is really, you know, he's an accomplished actor at this point, really intense, kind of low-key intense. I think it's kind of ridiculous that come the end of the movie, he's also a fighter. It could hold his own <laughs> against Patrick Swayze. That's the 80s kindness of, you know, ish, yeah. ish of it that I, ish. 
80s-ish, 80s-ishness of it. Yeah, yes. Yeah, kind of didn't care yeah. for. Uh, <laughs> but before he even gets to fighting Ben Gazzari, he fights Marshall Teague. And I told you guys about this a couple of weeks ago. I had, I had learn, only just learned about it where Patrick Swayze, and this is the final fight where Patrick Swayze is forced to do his, forced to do, I don't know if he really is forced to do. <laughs> but he rips the guy's throat out, which is a thing he's trying to avoid after having to kill somebody, after killing somebody like that in self-defense years earlier. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Swayze said to Marshall Teague, let's just really fight. Mm-hmm. And they did. Yeah. And so about it, this. Yeah. it has that feeling. So the best probably fight scene of the whole movie is the last one mm-hmm. in that regard. Yes. In the new movie, I don't know. I like a Billy uh, Magnuson, I think you say his name. I like him in mm-hmm. lots of things. But his evil, rich guy was he's kind of goofy, muscle, you know, mustache twirling a little bit mm-hmm. too much. He's mm-hmm. just an evil yes. douche. That's all he was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, like said, a brat. He yeah. was a... A mm-hmm. rich, bratty, yeah. yeah, unreasonable. Uh, Daddy's <laughs> money. I, I, I suppose, mm-hmm. however, it is balanced out by the, I don't know, roid-raged, coke-fueled seeming, <laughs> not, not that he really is, the character, right. uh, Knox, played by actual MMA fighter Conor McGregor, in oh, his right. acting mm-hmm. debut. Yes. Now, this guy is a meme right now. If you see, people are <laughs> all over the place making fun of how he walks. Mm-hmm. That was... With one, <laughs> I saw like that. a bulldog. <laughs> Yeah, and I thought that. I honestly thought when I saw that, I thought this guy is just starting acting. Either he really walks like that, or it's a brilliant choice. Right. I remember when I was starting out, w- w- this one woman that I had acted with. She was a young actor at the time, just like me. She had this technique. What she did was, is she would decide what animal her character was most like and mm. adopt some of those animalistic characters. It looked like he did that kind of work, right? He had some kind of like bulldog or gorilla. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I saw somebody joking on the internet, pretending they were directing him. They're like, okay, uh, Connor, what we need you to do. Uh, they were trying to correct it. Connor, can you please just one time when you walk, have your arms actually touch the sides of your body and have your legs closed, please? Just this one time. And then he does it again. They're like, oh, you, you. oh. But that said, yeah. he was maniacal <laughs> and over the top in a way that, uh, you, you know, like I'm saying, I didn't like about uh, Billy Mag- Magnuson's uh, Brad, Brad, Brandt character. I think it's Brad. Whatever. I liked yeah. I liked Conor McGregor as that nut job. He was like a <laughs> chaos agent. It was he like was. The about the Joker in in, in, in Batman, uh, what is it, uh, The Dark Knight. Yeah. yeah. He just wants to see the world burn. I don't even know if he was getting paid. We don't know. He just shows up. (laughs) And things were literally burning behind him, right? When you first see him and he acquires clothing. And as he walks, as he walks away, or we can call it walking. Yes. Lopes, whatever he did. It's just on fire behind him. Yeah. (laughs) I loved Conor McGregor's performance in this. Again, we talked a few weeks ago about uh-huh. I have misgivings about the man and his actions in the real world. I wasn't expecting a lot yes. from him. I was expecting he's an intimidating presence, period. But when he opened his mouth, it would break it for me. But it yeah, didn't. Yeah, okay. yeah. He did, I thought, an admirable job portraying this chaos machine, like you said. However, in the structure of the film, he only comes along because everyone who's come up against Dalton so far has been ap- handed their ass and he is the last resort. Mm. So he's not like the big bad until end of the third act almost is when he comes in, unfortunately yeah. for me. Uh-huh. I don't like to see more of him or him be more intelligent and be more wrapped into. He's basically, they called a tornado because all the rational and thoughtful solutions were done. They're like, mm-hmm. well, this guy's going to tear up everything he sees. Just call him. And it was almost too much. <laughs> and I, I, I think he was going to be the, the, he got people to watch the film and I'm glad that they did. Mm-hmm. I don't think I liked his character as much as they wanted me to, mm-hmm. but I did love his performance in the film. I thought he yeah. nailed what he was told to do. Yeah. 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 Some of those things that you're mentioning for me are those things that felt out of formula, but I didn't mind because it felt more like a mm-hmm. film from the, some maybe the later 80s like a can mm-hmm. that okay. the fact that he was kind of deus ex machina like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a thing that was planted and then paid off he wasn't yeah. even brought in by the character any character that we knew in the movie no. it was an off screen mm-hmm. character i mean right. that kind of stuff it was like <laughs> yeah this is kind of amateurish filmmaking but i kind of liked that about it cuz it mm-hmm. felt like a b movie and i don't know mm-hmm. uh, with the i a think movie the knox budget, character yeah you know, i think the knox character could have been better utilized if his shadow was already across 
this story from the beginning and we yeah. just didn't know when he would come into play yeah. the only reason you knew he was coming because you saw the trailer yes he yeah. was absolutely a well we've run out of ideas to throw up against dalton let's make up a new yeah. guy <laughs> if you had integrated him into the infrastructure of the the evil whatever people trying to steal stuff if he was already a guy somebody knew and they maybe we saw him earlier doing something else that would have been cool so you knew he was on the table but he kind of mm -hmm. got slipped in the deck at the end he was this wild card and that felt mm -hmm. unearned See, you remind me, John, based on the trailer, I thought what they were going to do was he was somehow involved in the thing that got Jill in the Hall's MMA fight. Out of M yeah. Mm -hmm. So when this guy shows up. And it's up, a rematch. Right. Some rematch is what I was thinking. Shit. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Not this guy I thought again. that too. And it rattles yeah. him, but it doesn't. But now, Bill says mm. the best review I saw commented that McGregor walked around the movie like he had the worst case of hemorrhoids. And then I watched <laughs> the movie and I could see nothing but that. Yeah. Oh. That. I'll tell you what I thought when I watched it. I thought mm -hmm. this guy's acting like he has 10 pound balls. Oh, that's like, what I, the way he's strutting, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing is like, Oh, don't want to chafe. <laughs> you know, it's that right. <laughs> my muscle and, or my muscles are so big. I, yeah. Everything yeah, is, uh, yeah. <laughs> can't scratch my own back. I'm so damn big. <laughs> uh, I guess what a screen presence though. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if you, if you do watch the movie, Hang around for the after credits. Or maybe it's mini yeah. credits. Do. Mm -hmm. Yes, which do, do, do. It, it speaks to this idea, John, like, and maybe, and your cat, your idea too, which I was teasing you about. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is to set up a sequel that he is, mm -hmm. this is the beginning of Dalton's story and mm -hmm. Knox, who seemed to die, maybe he'll be back. We don't know. <laughs> uh, and then I, I guess <laughs> Finally, uh, not necessarily sort of, I don't mean last but not least. Is, is there some Wait, of the, I, I just caught that Cat yeah. was miming the final fight. She's doing this. Is <laughs> that what that was? <laughs> I, I just figured it out. Oh. I just figured it out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If, you if you know, you know. I was yeah, if you know, you know. <laughs> uh, are, are you okay, Cat? Are you having a seizure? Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> look, there's tons of actors and characters in, in these films, uh, but uh, the, the other sort of one that plays a, another main part is. The love interest slash doctor character in the original film, mm -hmm. we had Kelly Lynch playing Doc, mm -hmm. uh, which is a character that, uh, you know, sews up uh, Dalton, but also they mm -hmm. wind up having a romantic interest. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and this Stay awake, John. A, stay awake. Stay awake. Dan Sorry, Dan well. Yella, oh, oh, because the uh, Dan love Mel 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 Melchior uh, is playing uh, the, that type of role uh, this time <laughs> in a character mm -hmm. named Ellie. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, she takes care of him. In fact, they, they share a, a line, one of the homages to the original, they, they, there's a line in both films where he tells uh, her that uh, no one wins a fight, which is a mm -hmm. sweezy line. Thank you for saying that because I forgot to look it mm -hmm. up. I was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was there, the same. I, I think both work well, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Both uh, have the charm. Uh, and mm -hmm. certainly it seems like they have the, the chemistry. I think maybe... Swayze and Kelly Lynch had a little more chemistry than these two. Oh, well, new movie, yeah, new movie, yeah. but yes, that, but that was fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, and they my, both. Go ahead, John. My favorite sleeper character in the film was the bartender. The girl oh. that's a bartender that brought Dalton breakfast one morning on the houseboat. Oh yeah, yeah. She came out of nowhere to be yeah. an just an absolutely oh. adorable character. Yeah. That isn't isn't one and done. You see her a few times doing different mm -hmm. things throughout the film. And I'm uh -huh. like, awesome. This little part that could have been nothing. Uh -huh. I, mean, I know we lost we lost characters and archetypes from the, the Swayze film, right? We we lost the uh uh the the, the mentor bouncer because we had the, the bouncer verse was gone kind of thing. So there right. were slots to fill in other interesting characters that persevered. Uh -huh. And I thought that addition speaks to the the somewhat more lightheartedness of this roadhouse, both in yeah. Dalton and also uh -huh. in the people that surround him, they're a little more upbeat and optimistic than, you know, oh, it's oh so, you know, dreary. Yes. Right. But John, remember in the old one, there was someone who filled that role, maybe not quite as well or, or as mm -hmm. much to your liking, but was she, um, I, I guess she wasn't a bartender. I was trying She's to remember. I didn't have time to rewatch. Yeah. yeah, she was like a barmaid. Was? Yeah. There yeah. was someone who, who brought Swayze breakfast? Like, oh, it's true. You're right. Another another too. connective tissue there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was She's one of my actor. my. But she wasn't as memorable for me. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This mm -hmm. one stuck out for you, and um, yeah, I loved her too. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. I yeah. see characters like that. I'm like, I want to mm -hmm. see the next thing you do because I loved you in this mm -hmm. in a tiny part. 
please put her in something else because I think Aww. she needs more work. She was, mm-hmm. I thought she was great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think one thing with regard to these two characters, you know, from or this one character archetype in both the films, one, one thing that I thought was interesting was and there's a moment, you know, we both, it, both of these Daltons have a dark secret. They're keeping it from their love interest. Mm-hmm. And in the original film, played by Kelly Lynch, this character, Doc, she sees him kill uh, Marshall Teague's character, Jimmy Reno. Mm-hmm. And she's horrified. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. She's horrified. Mm-hmm. You, you, something that you think she's never going to, reasonably so, never going to recover from, seeing someone you like murder somebody. And, you, you know. <laughs> and again, <laughs> I contend he didn't have to rip that guy's throat out. Yeah. He had right. the and upper dump hand. dump his body could, in the river. He could have yeah. done any number of things. <laughs> Yes, he didn't have to do that. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Anyway, but in yeah. this Mr. Film, Dalton, I mean, did you then call an ambulance? Um, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't. Right. No, a coroner? Anything? <laughs> no, no, I, I threw him in the him. river. I figured, you know, somebody find him. I gave him a mouth to blowhole and tried to. <laughs> I'll be your larynx. Larynx. Oh. Larynx. Your larynx. Larynx. <laughs> Um, and in that movie, by the end of it, Kelly Lynch, though, you know, so then they have this scene with Ben Ben Gazzara after that. They, mm. they reconcile, you know, and I think at the yeah. very end of the movie, they're like swimming in the lake together or something. Oh, that they're skinny movie. dipping or whatever they're doing. Yeah. yeah. But in the new movie, similarly, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal murders all these people and his love interest. That's it. They're done. You know, he's mm. she seems similarly shook up. And by mm-hmm. the end of that movie, again, spoiler alert, he mm-hmm. just moves on. You know, he leaves town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was maybe, pretty different. Maybe I'll maybe I should cut this out from the audio podcast. Only because we've managed not to be terribly spoilery, I think. Maybe. <laughs> I, don't know. I, don't know. I I think the statute of limitations on the eighties roadhouse is up. So we can talk about yeah, that. I'll bleep out Certainly. the other thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there you go. Now you know uh, so yeah. that's that's I think that's it. You guys have anything else about that? Looking at my notes. Um, this is where Kat just reads off a list. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I didn't. Uh, oh, I, I have a couple of things. The music was just as good. I, I enjoyed it as much as I did mm-hmm. in the original movie. The whole kind of blues rock. I, oh, I enjoyed okay. that. Oh, the live bands. That was something I almost messaged you guys about. Yeah. <gasps> Every time they needed a good appropriate song instead uh-huh. of it sneaking in underneath the the film uh-huh. they were on stage and another amazing blues group was performing it and they would keep performing throughout the fight and then sometimes they would cut back and you go oh i forgot they were playing here on stage it was great yeah the music I was awesome also love that and yes that they kept playing no matter what may was going on they just <laughs> They just persevered. We got both kinds, country and Western. Right? Is that the chicken wire situation? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that yeah, was. That's the first one. That was yeah, amazing. I, I, I didn't yeah. look up, and I, I certainly should have, but we mm-hmm. know Jeff Healy is, you know, was a real singer, performer, yeah. mm-hmm. that was in the film. In the original mm-hmm. film, I don't know if that woman that was singing in, in, in the, the band there, was she. she's a real known performer. But there were she lots of record. different vocalists and groups, I thought. Yeah, I picked yeah, up on lots of ones. different ones. Yeah. 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 I wonder if they were featuring other up-and-coming acts or. Um, yeah. Very possibly, but you I felt it, like that was a connective it. tissue between the two that um, mm-hmm. I, re- I really liked. And, and they were similar. It was a bluesy rock kind of thing. And I was yeah. like, all right, yeah. yeah this well, is I want the you. soundtrack. I was thinking mid film, yeah. like I would listen to this. This is yeah. great. Yeah. And the, and the original film too, tons of good music yeah. uh, mm-hmm. from the soundtrack, including some mm-hmm. st- stuff you wouldn't hear at uh, the the uh, Roadhouse necessarily. I think I think uh, New Order, Blue Monday is in, is in there, if I recall. Oh. Oh, but, really? but I thought you were going to say, Kat, and you remind me is, so the, mm-hmm. the the new film, the 2024 version of Roadhouse is scored by Christoph Beck, who's scored okay. dozens and dozens of films, plenty of, uh-huh. I'm sure you've seen before. Mm-hmm. But what I think really elevated the 1989 movie, and I think but for the score, mm-hmm. it wouldn't nearly seem as good as it is. Hmm. I think if you had anybody else score okay. it. Yeah, I think it would have okay. seen a lot more B movie, but it was more like a B plus, A minus movie because it was scored <laughs> by Michael Kamen. <laughs> Okay. Michael, the late Michael Keeman, who sadly died long before he could continue his work, because if it wasn't talking about John Williams earlier, if if John Williams didn't score the film in the 1980s, they went for Michael Keeman. He did dozens of movies during his lifetime, including many, many in the 1980s, including Mm -hmm. the entire Die Hard franchise and the score for the original film, uh, Roadhouse in 89, sounds very much to me like the Lethal Weapon score. Oh. And I think um, for me, a lot of that pulling out my heartstrings and making me feel different things from for Swayze's Dalton, 
Yeah. And feeling like this is a quality film was because of that. Mm. Mm. Very cool. Very so I have a question for both of you. Cool. Yeah. Ooh, all right. So Answer. this is, this is one of those fight? stupid memes you see online to, to try to prompt engagement, but I'm just going to prompt engagement from you guys and also <laughs> anyone here watching live. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you could only keep one. Oh, man. You had to burn one. You could never watch it again. Yeah. Mm. And you, the, this other one, you could continue to watch in perpetuity yeah. whenever you wanted to. Which mm -hmm. one would you save? That's easy for me. Yeah? Go yeah, for it. Cat is conflicted. Go for it. Definitely one. the original mm -hmm. one. And uh, it, okay. it might be part in part nostalgia. And it, mm -hmm. quite honestly, I couldn't separate that from it. Right. But it has some little elements of it. Um, that again that i pointed out earlier that i like the way they, they, they did his character which is more in line with the types of films i like than this one and again mm -hmm. i like this movie but if i had to pick one 1989's uh roadhouse swayze's okay yeah what do you and think Kat? i think because because i don't i don't have that super strong emotional connection or sentimental connection to the original movie of course to aspects of it you know like like patrick swayze or the, the feel of it or whatever mm -hmm, yeah. but Man, like when watching both of them, the, the new one, I found myself having more reaction to, like laughing at it or being mm -hmm. like, "Whoa, wow!" Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it just kind of, um, yeah. I I just had a higher intensity reaction to it, so I feel like, yeah, I feel like the new one might be the one that I would keep. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I also have a warm spot for the original Roadhouse, but yeah. after seeing this one, I feel like I've seen that one enough. Okay. <laughs> not that I don't like it. I, again, admittedly, yeah. I do enjoy that film. I think it yeah. is a not as good a film as its reputation, but mm -hmm. its reputation is based on how much people enjoy it. So it's mm -hmm. earned whatever whatever spot it has. Mm -hmm. It's fine. But yeah, I did like Kat said, and ironically, is this often in the middle between you two. <laughs> <laughs> Almost for the reasons Will lists, I'm on the other side of the fence from his reasons, the things that mm -hmm. he kind of moves you towards Swayze's film. I, I go to, mm -hmm. toward Gyllenhaal's because mm -hmm. of how it breaks in structure, the things it does differently, and the mm -hmm. feeling that I got and the emotions, um, the humor, the the, mm -hmm. uh, the the every man kind of thing. He wasn't in this secret society sort of deal. So I, I definitely, I would, I would go with the newer one. Not to denigrate the old one, but I had to pick oh, no. one. To mm -hmm. watch again, I'd watch the new one. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. I think along those lines, and I said about Edge of Tomorrow, showing people that movie, if had somebody come over and I was going to show them a roadhouse, I'd mm -hmm. probably show them new one over the old one because I'd be uh -huh. confident they'd have a sort of popcorn good time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. The other one's a little, you know, slower mm -hmm. and more, I don't want to say more intellectual. They might then want to see the old one <laughs> to see yeah. it's, it's kind right. of its origin. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yep. They might get uh, inspired. See. Yeah. Uh, Read some of the comments here. Brandon says, I actually mm -hmm. like this remake, even though I don't really like Gyllenhaal or McGregor. The original had Sam Elliott in it, though, and no one can replace him. You know, you know True. Sam Elliott is kind of that Sam Elliott's kind of that third act uh, deus ex machina Conor McGregor. You know, it's almost like mm. they drop. Yeah. I didn't like that about the movie. I love <laughs> Sam Elliott. Yeah. But yeah. it kind of, for me, detracted from the power of Patrick Swayze's character that he needed to call but, in another. But at least young. Sam Elliott's character already existed at the beginning of the film he wasn't mm -hmm. snuck in you know what i mean yes. he, did, yep, he didn't absolutely. appear as prominently but he existed yeah mm -hmm. yeah and that's you know in writing they call about planting something and then having a payoff yeah they didn't plant conor yeah. mcgregor john you're right 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 uh, um, keith says is roadhouse 2 one of those things that we acknowledge exists like alleged sequels to blue brothers and cash <laughs> oh <laughs> i would say not even that keith <laughs> We're going to pretend uh, it never happened altogether. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I never saw it. So, um, Easy for wants me. to recast a Jake Gyllenhaal. Who would have been a better match for the character these days? I like him, but he's almost miscast in this role. I don't hmm. know. I think he's, I actually like him in this role because I think he's that balance of handsome, charming, and, you know, Rugged. physically, you know, mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah. Although I saw people online and it's these guys who, you know, fancy themselves real men versus, you know, the beta cucks of the world. And then they were saying, "Who this guy couldn't beat Alpha anybody? Bro. Just, just right. look at him. He couldn't beat up anybody." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> I, I disagree with that. He's got swarfed hands. Miss <laughs> yeah. uh, So's picking the original though, and Brandon's picking the okay. original as well because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. of Sam Elliott. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill says I ditch both and keep a Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cheating. That's oh, cheating. Man. Bill made a funny comment earlier. I don't know if I can find it, but um, it, he was pointing out how in the, the 80s film, yep. there was um, a lot more exposure of um, 
a female, yeah. <laughs> female uh, torso, then just there say was... it, Kat. This is not a <laughs> G-rated show. No. I, that's is my way. I like to be funny that way. <laughs> I honestly didn't know what you were thinking. First, <laughs> I pictured was midriff. Then I pictured just a torso, like it had been boxed. <laughs> and that was a horror movie that I saw once. I don't want to ever see that again. Oh, no. Oh, my okay, God. Okay, so, yes, there was more gratuitous nudity. In, in more gratuitous films, nudity, yeah. and that's what my husband was also noticing when we watched. He was oh, Very disappointed, yeah. wasn't he? Very he, disappointed. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is Kelly Lynch doing Although, it? I don't we're oh, going to see an, yes. an equal amount of male torso nudity yes. in this. Mm -hmm. Swayze was always shirtless, inexplicably oh, yeah. shirtless in the oh, first wait. one. We also yeah. see his naked behind in the first film as well, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well. Oh. Well, I think yeah. Conor McGregor makes up for that in this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Multiple times. Here's a little something for the ladies. <laughs> and could they not afford clothes that fit Conor McGregor? Because didn't it look like everything was just a little too tight and small? Well, all of his clothes were stolen, a la Terminator. <laughs> it's, we we saw him get his jacket after after the fire. <laughs> I just assume he's like, you look about the right size, and he punches yeah. him until he no, oh, it's a little tight. That's yeah. fine. I don't feel like beating up another guy that's bigger. <laughs> uh, all right, hey, that was our show. Oh. Yes, that was our show, which was brought to you thanks in part to our early adopters, Rick Parker and Karen Flieger. Yay! <laughs> My screen's not changing. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> I will put it, Kat. You don't have to do it. We have the budget to add it. We need it. Okay. It's emotional. I Insert here, here Will. Da -da -da -da. I <laughs> my own head and thank i should keep it in my head okay and thank you especially to our secret of our success level patreon supporters <laughs> nick guillory craig coletta matt marino john henderson brandon greer marcus taylor and tony gray great i gotta beat her to it now <laughs> hey, thanks everybody for supporting our show. We are so very grateful that uh, you uh, help us uh, get it done. Literally help mm -hmm. us uh, get it out there every week after week. If you'd like to join the ranks and help the show, please go to patreon.com slash 1980s now. It looks like mm -hmm. 1980 snow, but it's 1980s mm -hmm. now. Yes. All right. And uh, learn snow how kidding. you can uh, give us a dollar <laughs> or two and earn our forever gratitude. All right, hey, uh, that's it. We will. Uh, t thanks, for guys, for joining us on the live. C certainly, uh, folks listening at home, uh, join us some other time, uh, Wednesdays, seven p.m. Eastern. Yeah, we will talk to you then next time on Nineteen Eighties Now. Until next time. Nobody ever wins a fight. Oh, nice. Mm. <laughs> All right, everybody. <laughs> do, 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 so says what movies or will watch? Oh, Beta Cucks. That's hey, a what? thing. Look, look I watch. A, I watch movies. You got your beta cucks beta and your cucks alpha bros. Yeah. But yes, John knows what I'm talking about. There's these guys online. And they're trying to engage me in these arguments. Like, I oh, can't remember man. what thing I was posting about. Oh, man. It was my opinion about some movie or something online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their response was, was, I bet you don't even lift weights, have never I'm fired sure a Kathleen gun. I'm sure it was Kathleen Kennedy related. And, oh, yes, John. Thank <laughs> it you. It had That's to exactly be. That's exactly right. Had to be. That's exactly right. I was defending some female. That's what it was. Yeah. And it was... You're a beta cuck. You haven't. You don't lift weights. You don't. Never fired a gun in your life. You've never been in a fight. What? <laughs> oh, come on! Right. It's because I use my wits, <sighs> Alpha Bro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, meanwhile, I've done all those things. So, I mean, what does right. that say then? But even if you say that, well, but still, <laughs> did you come back and go? Do you even know the difference between there, there, and there, or it's and it's? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Another when to use an apostrophe? What? You're alpha bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you even read, bro? Yeah. <laughs> Come back and read. Throw medicine. <laughs> I like that, John. That's got to be a t-shirt. But instead of like a weights, it's like a, yeah, it's like a book right. or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you even, Do you even right, read, bro? Hey, thanks, guys. That's like right. Yay. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Extra fun. We'll talk to you again. Bye, uh, everybody. <laughs>